PlayStation consoles, a necessity for gracious living. Although it is undeniable that the handheld gaming market has been absolutely dominated by Nintendo since pretty much day one, you can't help but admire Sony for its noble efforts in attempting to usurp the big end and cement itself at the top of the portable gaming ladder. As we all know by now, they didn't even come remotely close to actually managing this, but Sony's two major handheld systems, the PSP and the PS Vita, did a pretty good job of permeating the mainstream, at least. Although they didn't quite live up to expectations, well, at least from Sony's lofty perspective, the PSP and the Vita are both fondly remembered and hold a respectable place in gaming history. But what about Sony's other, less talked about and almost forgotten entry into the handheld gaming market? What was the story there and why does no one seem to ever mention it today? In fact, I purchased this system at launch in 2011, yet even to me, weirdly, it feels like it never existed. I don't hold much in the way of vivid memories of either using or loving it, so this begs the question, was it an innovative device that's worth a second look in 2022, or is it just another redundant piece of tech that no one needed or asked for? That's right, fellow nerds, today we're going to dust off our old SIM cards and take a look at Sony's other handheld gaming device, their weird Robocop-esque mobile phone and handheld hybrid from the early 2010s. I am Lady Decade and this is a story of the Sony Ericsson Xperia Play, a device that some may recall as being the Sony PlayStation phone. It almost seems like a lifetime ago now, especially after so many years of Apple leading the pack. But back in the day, Nokia was the original dominant mobile phone brand and stood head and shoulders above the rest of the competition in the field. With the swift progression of mobile technology during the late 90s and early 2000s, and the steady increase in popularity of video games, Nokia could recognize the potential for a device that could make the best of both worlds and combine gaming with a mobile phone. It sounded like a tremendous idea on paper, but in practice, the silly sausages over at Nokia gave us the absolute abomination known as the N-Gage, which was not only a complete commercial failure, but was also a borderline unplayable joke. Seriously, this thing is an absolute mess. From crippling frame rates to unfathomably terrible controls to game-breaking aspect ratios, it's unbelievable that this ghastly little device actually made it past quality control. Despite Nokia's huge, huge misstep, it was clear that the concept behind the N-Gage was a good one. So companies such as Samsung started attempting to capitalize on this potential cash cow and released various mobile phone devices with gaming functionality in mind. None of these newfangled smartphone hybrids affected the market in any hugely meaningful way, but they certainly hadn't escaped the attention of the watchful eye of Sauron, sorry, Sony who seemed like they may be keen to jump on the bandwagon, having learned from the earlier mistakes made by Nokia. After all, Sony, with their PlayStation brand, had one of the strongest reputations in the world. There had been speculation about a potential Sony-branded gaming phone since around 2006, when Sony Computer Entertainment filed a patent for a PlayStation smartphone around the time the PSP was enjoying its most success. However, there was no news about the development of such a device for around a year, so people started to forget all about it. But their collective memories were jogged in mid-2007, when a Sony Ericsson executive announced that they were working on a device that would incorporate Sony's award-winning cross-media bar within its hardware. Developed by a little known Kyoto based company by the name of Q Games Limited in 2003, the cross media bar is the super swanky and instantly recognizable interface used by Sony, and initially used on the Japanese exclusive PS2 variant, the PSX, and then on all of their subsequent gaming devices up to the PlayStation 3. 
Sony found the cross-media bar to be so versatile and user-friendly that they even ended up using it in some high-end television sets, some HD TV set-top boxes, many mid-2000s Blu-ray players, and even in some of their fancier cameras. Although the iconic interface started being phased out by Sony after the release of the touchscreen Vita, which did away with the oh-so-familiar scrolling icons, the cross-media bar is still regarded by many as the PlayStation's finest signature look, bougie. The line about it being award-winning wasn't a gag either, it actually won an Emmy Award. Specifically, the Technology and Engineering Emmy for Outstanding innovation and achievement in advanced media technology for the best use of personal media display and presentation technology all the way back in 2006. And wowzers, that is quite possibly the longest a title for an award in history. The award should be given the award of being the longest award title. Sony continued to be back and forth on whether or not this so-called PlayStation phone was ever going to be a reality or not, with various company bigwigs seeming to contradict each other. In mid-2007, David Reeves, who was the head of Sony Computer Entertainment Europe at the time, point-blank denied that such a device was in existence or was even being considered for development. Meanwhile, during the 2007 Games Convention, Sony Ericsson executive Peter Arnegard said regarding a PlayStation smartphone that it is obviously something we are looking at, but right now I can't really comment. As Sony seemed to be continuing to push the PSP with them even releasing a heavily publicised digital-only variant called the PSP Go, it looked like the PlayStation phone rumours were probably going to end up just being rumours. The following year, 2008, saw what looked like to be some significant progression, however, when Sony Magazine broke the news that a new PSP-style phone was indeed in development. Unfortunately, though, it turned out that the cheeky sods had jumped the gun, as the PlayStation phone was reportedly scrapped completely in early 2009. They just couldn't seem to make their mind up. The decision to terminate development plans was apparently due to a rather nasty fallout between Sony and Sony Ericsson in early 2009, which came about because Sony refused to license the PlayStation brand to their Swedish subsidiary unless Sony themselves could produce the handset independently. This all just turned out to be handbags at dawn, and the situation was thankfully resolved and rectified by June of that year, when the world's largest financial newspaper, the Nikkei, reported that Sony Ericsson was developing a cell phone Game Gear hybrid. A cell phone Game Gear hybrid? I mean, even for 2010, that is a hilariously dated reference. They went on to say that it was intended to be a competitor to Apple's iPhone and would combine the functionality of a mobile phone with a handheld gaming device. It was clear that this speculative piece of hardware was a huge international talking point, as the Nikkei report was followed by a feature in the Wall Street Journal which gave further details about the device's smartphone functionality, coupled with its ability to download games. The first images of the system were leaked by technology blog Engadget in 2010, although some initially questioned the legitimacy of these photos. They showed a prototype running on Android 2.2 with a sliding touchscreen and conventional looking video game controls. These leaked images were eventually proved to be accurate when further information and photos surfaced of various prototype systems, including video footage shot in Greece of one working. Even more revealing, clearer videos were soon leaked, giving consumers a genuine idea of exactly what this new bit of kit was going to be capable of. But the biggest sticking point was now the branding and what the device was actually going to be called. It was initially reported that the final name for the system would be the Sony Ericsson Z1. And I did say Z1, Z, Z, I am English, Z, stop correcting how I say things. Although that was quickly debunked, many of the earlier leaked videos and stills showed the phone with no visible logos on its outer shell. But the latest images of the new device showed it to bear both the PlayStation and Xperia logos. 
Ultimately, the decision was made to focus on the Xperia line of smartphones and take out the PlayStation branding completely so as not to confuse consumers. Poor, easily confused consumers. We all know that they're not really the brightest bunch. Although Sony's new device was a gaming handheld crossed with a phone, it was still mainly going to be marketed as a smartphone and would go to retail as such. So there was indeed a fear that customers would reject a PlayStation phone offhand, assuming it would only be for games. After much deliberation and several unconfirmed fistfights, the final name Xperia Play was chosen. Released on the 1st of April 2011 and running on Android 2.3.7 Gingerbread, the Sony Xperia Play was actually not an April Fool's joke, but was in fact a touchscreen smartphone with a sliding form factor, 512 megabytes of memory and 400 megabytes of internal storage. This relatively small amount of storage can thankfully be extended by up to 32 gigabytes when making use of the micro SD card slot at the bottom of the phone. The Play was originally scheduled to be released worldwide at the start of March, but after Sony was forced to delay the device coming out in the UK and Ireland for a few weeks, further delays meant it ended up getting a staggered release across the rest of the globe throughout the spring and summer of 2011. The Sony Xperia Play features a 5.1 megapixel rear camera and a 1.3 megapixel front camera with a 4 inch TFT LCD screen capable of displaying an impressive 16 million colours. It boasts a surprisingly adequate speaker that has shown itself to be rather durable over time and goes quite a bit louder than one might expect given how pathetic mobile phone speakers from the era often were. Personally, I was hugely excited about this product and actually rushed out to go get one. Thankfully, getting one was pretty easy as Top Hat Gaming Man way back then had recently left university and worked for phones for you. So I went to the shop and purchased the phone directly from him. To be honest, I remember being absolutely chuffed to bits with my purchase and I rushed back to work because I was so excited to show my work colleagues this amazing phone I'd just got and I was going to tell them all about the great games I was going to play on it and they laughed at me. They all thought I was weird for wanting one of these and why didn't I get a Blackberry like a normal person? But the sorry truth is I'm not normal and neither was this phone. So were we? A match made in heaven. Well, let me discuss this product further. The device bears a striking resemblance to the PSP Go when its bottom half is extended. In fact, they actually look almost identical. And it's why a lot of people dismiss the play on release as merely another system running on old PSP hardware. When the device is in its vertical orientation, it looks just like any other Android smartphone from 2011. But when it's placed on its side and the gamepad is slid down, we can see the familiar looking D-pad and PlayStation button layout, as well as a design theme and dimensions eerily similar to the Go. In addition to the screen being slightly larger with touchscreen capabilities and a higher resolution, the Play has the PSP Go trumped in other areas too. The D-pad feels more comfortable and responsive, the start and select buttons are in a more sensible location and best of all, we now have twin touchpads to replicate twin analog sticks. So a lot more interesting than my colleagues basic bitch suggestion of going out and purchasing a blackberry blackberries honestly how naff were people in 2011 all in all, I have to say that the Xperia Play is an extremely well-designed piece of hardware with a tremendous form factor that feels comfortable to both hold and play. Unlike many other similar devices from that period, they seem to have been built to last too, as it is still incredibly easy to find a perfectly working one today in 2022. But this doesn't mean that the device was anywhere near to perfect. I mean, for me, the touchscreen on mine doesn't work anymore, so there is that, but apparently that's actually quite easy to get repaired. But anyway, a discernible issue with the general design and functionality is with the twin touchpads. 
Although they work well when it comes to assigning different button layouts and 2D games, the restricting amount of multi-directional inputs makes them less than ideal candidates for an analog stick replacement. When it comes to the actual gaming side of things, the Xperia Play's biggest selling point was probably its PS1 emulation, and that was certainly why I wanted it. At the time of the device's release in 2011, emulation wasn't exactly a brand new thing, and tech-savvy people had been playing Super Nintendo and Mega Drive games and whatnot on smartphones for a while, but a legitimate mobile 32-bit emulation to the standard on display here was pretty much unheard of, so I was very very excited about this system. A common misconception about the Play is that it is capable of natively playing PSP games, but that is not something it was ever designed to do, and it is internally very different from its handheld cousin. The Play came with a free game as standard in the form of the original Crash Bandicoot, which players would have to download from the store. The device plays games via an app called PlayStation Mobile, which changes the phone's interface from that of a regular old Android communication device to the previously mentioned sexy old Emmy-winning Cross Media Bar, which makes the play resemble a PSP Go even more closely. Downloading games was quick and easy, as there was a dedicated section in the Google Play Store for purchasing individual titles for use within the PlayStation Mobile app, which sadly but hardly unexpectedly now no longer exists. The excellent PlayStation Pocket app also allowed users to download full original PS1 games on the device in all their shimmering low polygon glory. Sexy low polygon glory. If we're being generous, the Xperia Play could be looked at as more of an experiment and merely an attempt by Sony to dip their toe in the crossover smartphone waters. So it couldn't be considered an outright failure in those terms. However, as the initial plan for the device was for it to be a direct competitor to the iPhone 4, it's pretty obvious that Sony massively missed the mark with their mobile gaming hybrid. They didn't seem to have much luck around this period, with the PSP going head to head with the DS, which ended up being one of the biggest selling gaming devices of all time. And the Xperia Play is in direct competition with a mobile phone phenomenon in the form of the iPhone. It may have had limited options and little chance to shine when it was actually in circulation, but what of the Xperia Play in 2022? Given the convenient form factor, the familiar feel of the PlayStation-style controller layout, and the fact that the Play is an Android device, it can make for a pretty solid handheld emulator if you're after something a bit different. There are certainly cheaper options out there, but if you happen to come across one in a car boot sale, or you've got one in the back of a cupboard, or you just appreciate the fact that they look damned cool, you can get a plethora of different emulators up and running incredibly easy on one of these old things. You're obviously going to get no results if you want to run anything more modern, but all of the 8 to 16 bit systems play as well as they would on any other Android device. And the PS1 emulation, which is the same one developed by Sony themselves, is practically flawless. It is extremely easy to be able to rip any game from the entire PS1 library, but more recently, even Dreamcast and Nintendo DS emulation has been made possible on the Xperia Play. Dreamcast game lists tend to be somewhere between unreliable and a mixed bag, but playing old DS ROMs reportedly usually works a treat, with the touchscreen functionality coming in extremely handy on certain games. All in all, although you don't hear the play being discussed much today, it certainly has a place in history and despite it not featuring the PlayStation logo, it is one fine addition to Sony's gaming legacy. It is a testament to the quality of engineering and manufacturing of the device that it is still in use today by very many people, being kept alive way beyond its natural lifespan by the blossoming emulation scene. If you are a fan of PlayStation controls and the Sony interface and are looking for a cool way to play old games, you could do a hell of a lot worse than play with the Xperia Play. 
So I am Lady Decade and that was the story of the Sony Ericsson Xperia Play. Well, if you enjoyed this video, then like, subscribe, hit that notification bell and leave me a comment down below. And as is usual at the end of my videos, I like to answer questions from my patrons. So today's question is from Tripper6669 and they ask what was the first rpg that you ever played so i'm gonna rewind back in my life back to being a teenager um and the first rpg that i actually got to have a go on was dark cloud on the ps2 but it wasn't the actual game it was on a demo disc um you see when i was younger I didn't really get to play any RPGs at all unless they were on demo discs and Dark Cloud is the one that that sticks out in my mind as being probably the first that I actually properly played and played until the demo was over and the reason for that is because any games that I got to play on the PlayStation had to have been bought by my nan for basically her PlayStation and then I would get to play with them when my nan was done um, or we played them on a Saturday night when we ran, went round there. But my nan wasn't interested in RPGs at all. She liked platformers um, and she liked adventure games. And I know I've said it a million times, but things like Tomb Raider. Um, so going on a few years after that, when I met my now husband, Top Hat Gaming Man, who wasn't called Top Hat Gaming Man back then when I first met him, he had a muggle name. Basically, he lent me a load of games and the first game that he really recommended that I give a go was Final Fantasy X. So I know that's a JRPG rather than being an RPG, but still, that was the first role-playing game that I actually got to play from start all the way through to the very, very end. So that game actually holds a huge amount of nostalgia for me. And that actually leads me on to another point. I played Final Fantasy X before playing Final Fantasy VII. And I still love Final Fantasy VII. I still think that's quite possibly still the best Final Fantasy game. Although it doesn't hold the nostalgia for me that 10 does. So if you would like to have your question answered at the end of one of my videos, then please consider becoming a backer over on Patreon. Thank you very much for staying around till this point in the video and see you all in the next one.